Welcome back to another episode of Mega Projects. This, always one of my favorites, giant guns shooting things into space, or at least trying to. It's a fun subject. This is Mega Projects. Let's do it. In the 1950s, humankind began its quest to put a human in outer space. The Soviet satellite Sputnik was the first of its kind to reach space, and in the years since, more than 2,000 have followed. All of those satellites reached space via the same methodology. They hitched a ride on a high-powered rocket launched through Earth's atmosphere. But many people, scientists and non-scientists alike, have asked if there is a more efficient and effective way of reaching the cosmos. That question led to the High Altitude Research Project, also known as Project HARP. Which is a bit redundant, because technically that makes its name Project High Altitude Research Project. But I guess Project HA has less of a ring to it. HARP is a cool name. Let's move on. HARP attempted to find new ways to reach the universe's remote realms for a fraction of the cost of traditional means. In doing so, they built the most massive gun ever made. But controversy surrounding money and politics ultimately led to its demise. Today, we're going to talk all about it. Who doesn't love massive guns? In the mid-1950s, the Canadian engineer Gerald Bull was working on anti-ballistic missile and intercontinental missiles for the Canadian Armaments and Research Development Establishment, CARD. However, he spent much of his time on an idea that more fully captured his imagination. While working on ICBMs that cruise dozens of miles above Earth's surface, he watched the world's superpowers devote vast amounts of resources to launch rockets high above the Earth and into outer space. Bull believed that he could do it for a fraction of the cost by replacing rocket engines with enormous cannons, but more Importantly, he felt his method would be more likely to work. Nowadays, more than 90% of satellite launches are successful, even the most ambitious ones. But throughout the 1950s, less than half of rocket-powered satellite launches were successful. These launches required complicated in-air procedures for rockets to shed layers of equipment as they reached higher altitudes. Bull felt that these intricate maneuvers contributed to the likelihood of failure. Bull convinced his colleagues at CART to give his idea a shot, and they proceeded with a handful of preliminary tests. To reduce costs, they started on the smallest scale possible, using 76mm cannons. It's unclear just how successful these early tests were. Still, they were at least convincing enough to attract the attention of the US Army's Ballistic Research Laboratory, BRL, and the Chief of Army Research and Development. At that time, the American Soviet arms race was picking up pace, and airplanes and missiles played a considerable role in the contest. However, the Army had no cost-effective way of gathering the necessary data in the atmosphere's upper regions, data that they needed to build these increasingly powerful planes and missiles. So, in 1960, the Canadians, CARD, and the Americans, BRL, teamed up and ran their own preliminary tests. Their main concern was whether a large gun was robust enough to launch probes into orbit and do so without destroying the weapon and the grounds on which it stood. The tests were, again, successful as the BRL produced a smoothbore 5-inch gun system that shot a small probe to 67 kilometers, that's 41 miles high. In 1961, Bull left Khan to join McGill University. The Canadian school promised $200,000, $1.7 million today, from the Board of Governors, but the project required more funding than that. So Bull turned back to the Americans and was met with the military superpower's unsurprising enthusiasm. The BRL responded by providing him with substantial financial backing, two 16-inch naval gun barrels, a lands mount, surplus powder charges, a heavy-duty crane, and a $750,000 radar tracking system. In early 1962, Bull announced the creation of HARP under the umbrella of the McGill University Space Research Institute. They stated that the project's goal was to launch satellites into space cheaply. Bull's partner, Donald Mordell, determined that the best location to build would be somewhere near the equator, so they looked at potential sites in the Caribbean. The most enthusiastic response came from Barbados, a small island off the coast of Venezuela. The Barbadian government felt it was an opportunity to get personally involved in space exploration research, benefiting its citizens. Unfortunately, that wasn't exactly the case, but it did serve as an essential location throughout Harp's life. Not only did the location close to the equator, relative to the United States, allow for increased velocity from the Earth's rotation, 
location, but its remoteness in the Atlantic Ocean also granted for the safe impacts of re-entry projectiles. Construction started on the High Altitude Research Facility in April of 1962, with a construction team digging a gun pit into the island's coral base to place one of the 16-inch guns. The team then built a raised concrete emplacement, creating enough space below the gun fixture to vertically fire the cannon. The first test shot was fired on January 20, 1963, with the massive gun firing a 315 kilogram slug over a thousand meters a second and reaching heights of three kilometers in less than a minute. About three minutes after firing, the projectile landed less than a kilometer away from the gun in the ocean. This marked the first time that an artillery gun was fired at such a steep angle. The first test used a rudimentary mock projectile, but the later series of tests used the Martlet 1. The Marlet 1 was the first in a new family of missiles, named after McGill University's mascot, the Martinbird. Before firing, these projectiles were encased in a sabor, a wooden shell that centered the Marlet in the gun barrel during firing. As the projectile proceeded, the Marlets were expanded to create more storage space inside, allowing them to carry metallic chaff, chemical smoke, or meteorological balloons for collecting data. Throughout 1963 and 1964, Harp ran tests with three different guns and six different versions of the Marlet. These included the Marlet 1, three iterations of the the 2, 2A, 2B, 2C, and two versions of the 3, 3A and 3B. Creative naming, guys. The 2 series performed consistently when shot with a 16-inch cannon, settling an altitude record of 92 kilometers and regularly reaching 80 kilometers, about 50 miles. Harp reduced costs to just $2,500 per launch, and the entire process of loading and firing a projectile took no more than 30 minutes. With these successes came increased funding, and the annual budget increased to $3 million, about $25 million today. With the increased finances, Harp improved their most massive gun, the 16-inch one. This project wasn't their first foray into custom gun development, but it was certainly the most mega. The 16-inch was already among the largest guns ever used, but the expansion project led Harp and the US Army into uncharted territory. In September of 1964, an extension was completed, but the new cannon was so powerful that it literally destroyed its encampment and then fell apart. The team took some time off from the project, perhaps to consider whether it was too ambitious of them to enlarge the 100-ton mega cannon. However, they then decided to extend it even more than they did the first time. The result was the largest operational artillery piece in history, with the gun weighing in at 200 tons and having a barrel over 36.5 meters long. However, the key to this second attempt was to expand and strengthen the gun pit to accommodate the massive artillery. The new cannon was a huge success, and by the end of the following year, Harp had shot well over 100 projectiles deep into the ionosphere, reaching at least 80 kilometers high. That's about 50 miles. According to NASA, outer space begins at almost exactly 80 kilometers from the Earth's surface, but it wasn't enough for Harp to be just touching the edge of space. They needed to get satellites into orbit, and doing so would require doubling the altitude of launches. The team determined that the best way to accomplish this was to unleash a new projectile, the Martlet 4, which included rocket jets that would ignite mid-flight to push past the Kármán line and deep into the ionosphere. The rocket would rely on sun sensors to determine altitude and ignite the jets at an appropriate height. Throughout the same year, the project expanded to a handful of locations throughout North America, including the high water range in Quebec and the Yuma Proving Grounds in Arizona, both of which received 16-inch guns. The installation in Arizona proved to be the most successful, as a modified gun housed there fired a Martlet II at 2,100 meters a second, reaching an altitude of 179 kilometers. That's about 111 miles, a record which still stands today. And I know I said on this channel I was just going to do the metric ones and would do the Imperial on screen, but I mean, it's so absurd that <laughs> I have to mention them. Despite the immense success throughout 1965 and 1966, Harp came to an abrupt close in 1967. The Canadian government entered a fiscal belt-tightening period, and Harp became an attractive option for politicians looking to reduce spending. They slashed funding for the program, and the United States quickly followed suit. Apart from a lack of desire to fully fund the program themselves, the American war in Vietnam was scaling up. Finally, NASA found increased success with each launch, convincing all interested parties that rocket engines were the best way to reach space. Bull started a new venture called the Space Research Corporation, but it never reached the same heights as its predecessor.
While Barbados was Harp's home, the group established a handful of installations throughout North America, including the Quebec and Arizona locations. While those three primary locations received 16-inch guns, the rest of the fixtures used smaller 5-inch and 7-inch guns. These minor test sites included Fort Greeley, Alaska, Wallops Island, Virginia, Aberdeen Proving Ground in Maryland, and White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico. The smallest regularly used gun of the bunch was the 5-inch. Harp's version was modeled after a 120mm T-123 gun used by the Ballistics Research Laboratory before Harp's founding. The initial design reached altitudes of 40 kilometers far below the goal, so the gun was modified by welding an additional 10 feet to the barrel of the original armament. This led to a dramatic increase in altitude as it now reached heights of over 73 kilometers. While this was still well below the 16-inch, the 5-inch had a considerable advantage as it could be launched and fired in about 20 minutes at the cost of just a few hundred dollars. 162 missiles were fired from the various 5-inch guns throughout Harp, most of which took place at the White Sands, New Mexico location. The 7-inch retained many of the advantages of the 5-inch, but was even more useful. It fired projectiles three times the weight of the 5-inch, all while maintaining a similar propulsion speed. This was achieved by extending the barrel of a 175mm M113 gun by 26 feet. The maximum height of the 7-inch was 107 kilometers, about 66 miles, at a speed of almost 3,000 meters a second. Unlike the 5-inch, though, the 7-inch was only used sparingly and only one iteration was built. It was used exclusively on the Wallops Island site, where it launched 34 missiles during its lifetime. Of course, the most mega of all the guns was the 16-inch. As we already mentioned, the 16-inch in Barbados became the most massive gun in the world after the original 100-ton gun added a 100-ton attachment. It consisted of two 16-inch U.S. Navy barrels welded together, each with a 16.4-inch diameter. It could fire at 2,164 meters a second with a maximum acceleration at launch of 15,000 g and a maximum altitude of 181 kilometers, which, to put it in like aviation terms, think of a plane 30 to 40,000 feet. Well, these went to 595,000 feet. While the guns built in New Mexico and Barbados were the main sites of most launches, Quebec's version actually became the largest, with an eventual barrel length of 54 meters, 176 feet. However, it was only capable of horizontal test flights and could not elevate higher than 10 degrees, rendering it much less effective than its alternatives. <laughs> While Harp made it clear that Bull's method effectively got projectiles into space, it remains unclear whether it could shoot satellites into orbit. Nowadays, space exploration and research remains an expensive and controversial endeavor. In times of economic contraction, these programs become attractive areas for massive funding cuts, begging the question of whether Harp's cheaper alternative could have saved billions of taxpayer dollars around the world. And that's where we'll end today's video. A bit of food for thought for you. I will say that this bull dude went on to have a crazy life beyond this and went on to build a massive gun for Saddam Hussein, which uh, was called Project Babylon. We've actually got a mega project. It might already be out. It might be coming up. I'm not sure what all of these videos are going out, but if you're watching this at any time, you know, a few months in the future, that video will be out. Project Babylon, it's crazy. If it's not out yet, well, look forward to that one. The best way to do that is by subscribing. And thank you for watching. Smash that like button.